afternoon, everybody, and, and, and thank you for joining us. Um, today we will be talking about moving to or living in, in Portugal. So naturally, there, there are some people here already living in Portugal, and, and to those, I, I say congratulations. I'm, I'm sure you're having an amazing time in, in such a beautiful country. And, and then we have those um, planning or looking to relocate. So naturally, there will be a bit of content today that maybe leans towards one or the other, but um, we tried to design this webinar that it will be um, really informative and, and, and add value to, to all of you. Um, so a brief introduction before we start. Um, my name is Matt Enfold, an advisor and director here at Fiduciary Wealth Management, and, and with me here is our managing director, Paul Correa. Um, so before we get into the, the, um, the details of, of the webinar, um, I just run through the agenda that we're, we're looking to cover today. So we we start off a, a brief um, explanation of, of who we are and, and, and what we do. Um, for those who we haven't had the pleasure of talking with before. Then we will talk um, about the UK side, exit in the UK and, and the all important issue of, of UK domicile. We'll then cover visas for, for those looking to, to relocate, um, to understand the taxation in Portugal. We will include some details about NHR, the non-habitual residency, um, but we have recently done a webinar on NHR um, for those who may have attended that, so we're keeping a little bit light on that and we can always refer back to there. Um, the taxation part, we'll cover the taxation of, of pension income for, for those retiring to, to Portugal and also the tax planning opportunities that, that we all have. Following that, we'll cover the, um, the frequently asked questions, a bit of additional advice and, and kind of key advice for, for those looking to, to relocate uh, uh, and living in Portugal and we will cover our roadmap. At the end, we will have the Q&A session. So you're able to submit your, your questions um, by text. Um, what I would say, submit these as we go on. We will pick them up at the end, um, but please submit them as we go and, and then we can, we can answer all of those when we get to the end. So, who are we? So um, I'm here with Paul. He's as founder of Fiduciary Well. Paul, do you mind introducing us and the company? Yeah, thank you, Matt, for the warm introduction. Um, I started my career in, in the Indian Revenue in 1984. I transitioned into financial services in 1989, so I have a background in private banking and wealth management, which goes back 33 years. It gives my age away. I'm a chartered banker by profession. And as Matt uh, mentioned, I co-founded Fiduciary Wealth in 2007, together with my partners, the owners of the oldest or lo longest standing bank one law firm in Gibraltar, founded in 1892. We also happen to be a member firm of NGI Worldwide, which has its origins in Weybridge in Surrey, and uh, it's a top 20 global accounts network. Uh, it is one of the oldest networks founded in 1947, originating in, in the UK, but it's mushroomed into a major network um, represented in 460 locations across 100 countries, seven continents, driving $1 billion in revenue. Our mission as a firm is um, dedicated is to positively shape the wealth of the expatriate community through tax-led wealth management advice. I am a great believer in the need to engage in a broader dialogue to develop deeper relationships and provide more client-focused solutions. Um, if I may just add, I'm also a strong advocate of the need to uh, offer expats holistic, tailored and impartial advice, and of course, advice which does stand the test of time. Okay, thank you, Paul. Um, I'm gonna pick up on something there. You said we are client focused. Yeah. So can you tell me, what's the difference between our approach when it comes to servicing clients of ours? Well, that, that, that's a really good question, man. And thank you for asking that. 
Um, funnily enough, I was recently invited to uh, join a panel of speakers in London to discuss the financial and lifestyle considerations of moving abroad. And I was, um, I was um, in, the, in the, my fellow panelist uh, who happened to be a direct competitor was asked to introduce himself. Luckily enough, uh, he was the first one on the panel to speak, and, and he was he, he he rattled on about um, you know how his company had grown exponentially, and there was an internal focus on growth. But at no time did he mention the most important stakeholder or asset, which is the underlying client. And that did surprise me a great deal. And let me say that this is not a criticism. Far from it. They have built a really successful business with this inward focus or inward looking uh, business model and, and good luck to them. But it did make me think about our mission, our purpose and our values. Um, and it gave me time to think before I had to address the audience. And um, yes, we are completely different matter. We have a family office approach offering a highly personalized service in which each and every client relationship matters to us and are, are very valued. Uh, relationships, as you know, is at the heart of everything we do. Uh, we have a completely long-term focus, not, not only in terms of our investment strategy, but in terms of how we deal with our client relationships. We're here to uh, preserve our client's legacy not just for their futures, but for the futures of those that depend on them. So we're thinking about second and third generation. And we are very passionate about possibly shaping the wealth of the expatriate community, mainly Brits, but not exclusively through tax-led wealth management advice. Perhaps one of the areas where we're different is, is ethics. You know, not only do we have a strong work ethic, but, but we have integrity and ethics, and we always do the right thing at the right time for the right reasons. And our mission is really very simple. Um, we want to help expats and their families the best we possibly can. And um, yeah, if I had to sum it in four words, I think we, we, it's all about servicing. It's all about helping clients. It's about caring deeply about those relationships. And it's about supporting them through the life journey um, in any which way we can. And I know it may sound terribly simplistic to some of you, uh, but that's who we are and what we stand for, and, um, and we're very proud of it. Very it, proud, uh, and we wouldn't change it. I, I think that's absolutely important. not. You know, yeah. I accept that this is not everyone's idea of a wealth management practice, but it's certainly the way we want to grow our business. Absolutely. Thank you, Paul. That's great. And um, okay, so we move on to um, part one. Um, so here we're, we're talking about exit in the UK. And, and for those listening who already live in um, Portugal, we're not talking about the, the physical exit. We, we're talking about doing things right and, and also considering the, the, the other um, considerations. So um, Paul, if you can start off for us. So, um, what does somebody need to do to ensure that their UK exit is clean, but also the UK residency is, is not be triggered? Yeah, well, there are many different factors that one needs to determine or one needs to consider and which will influence whether you're a UK tax resident or not in a particular tax year. The number of days you physically spend in the UK during the tax year is clearly an important consideration, but it's not the only factor that one needs to um, take into account. We also need to consider the pattern of your presence and your connections to the UK, which could include things as family connections, property, main residence, your working patterns and life, and of course, any social connections and you know even membership of golf clubs, etc. Uh, could potentially tie you to the UK. So it's the UK State re Residency Test 2013, which allows you to plan the date in which you become non-resident -re and, and determines how much time you can spend in the UK after having exited without re-triggering UK 
tax residency, which clearly is the whole point of moving abroad. It's lifestyle, but equally it's, it's about tax efficiency. We always advise that you should try and time your exit at the end of the UK tax year, which as you probably all know, runs until the 5th of April. Simply because it's a cleaner break from the UK and we always plan it from a UK perspective. I think because the UK is probably more structured in terms of how it works and so on. However, but, but let me say that inevitably, if you exit one country for another, you know, the tax year will be different. The UK runs from April to April, Portugal runs in a calendar year. So there's always bound to be an overlap, but I'd rather it be on the Portuguese end rather than on, at, at the UK end. You can, of course, um, and there are specific situations where you can, you, you, a split year rule applies automatically without the need to engage with HMRC and, and and there's no degree of ambiguity. So if you start employment overseas, um, that's one um, condition which would allow you to split your taxi in the UK, or if your spouse or partner were to start full-time employment overseas, that's a second opportunity to, to have a split year. And the third one is where, when you cease to have a UK home. Uh, other than that, it becomes a bit more messy, not impossible, but a bit more messy. But under those specific circumstances, you are allowed to apply for a split year from the UK, but that doesn't have to be 5th of April. Okay. Yeah. So that I think is is is, is quite um, yeah, it's, it's much cleaner. Okay, of course, yeah. So it's key to making it clean yeah. as, as, as much as possible. Okay, that makes sense, Paul. And um and then UK domicile, because I have many conversations with people about this. I know you do as, as well, Paul, and, and it's interesting that people don't quite understand it. They think, okay, we, we've left the UK, that's it, and, and they don't want to understand the connection with inheritance tax. So, Paul, can you kind of clear that one up a little bit? Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, many countries which are under Napoleonic, you know, rules, laws, Spain, Portugal, I think Italy and France, yeah. I believe. Um, I stand to be corrected, that, but I believe they will fall under, you know, inheritance tax is based on tax residency. Yes. In, in some Anglo-Saxon countries, you know, UK and Ireland are the ones that spring to mind. Um, inheritance tax is based on the concept of domicile. So let me tell you the good news. The good news is that there's no inheritance tax in Portugal for direct descendants. Great. The bad news is you're likely to remain UK uh, exposed to UK inheritance tax um, due to the fact that um, based on the on, on your domicile of origin. Now, your domicile of origin is something you acquire at birth, normally taken from your father. And uh, whilst you can claim and acquire a domicile of choice simply by settling in a country with the intention to remain there permanently, um, it is not straightforward. It's always fraught with difficulty, not as you know, and there are no fixed rules and the burden of proof always falls on the taxpayer to prove that they've acquired a new domicile of choice. And that's why one needs to trade really carefully. Um, and in any event, even if you were to um, acquire a domicile of choice, and you would say, to the UK, you know, uh, to HMRC, I have chosen Portugal to be my domicile of choice, and that's where I'm not just tax residents, but domicile. There's things that can re trigger UK tax residency and domicile. So, and, and in, in our experience, Matt, uh, um, you know that it's not uncommon for Brits to return to the UK either one temporarily and most often it's due to ill health, yeah. or two, uh, to return permanently following the death of a spouse. And even when it's on a temporary basis for one year, that's enough to trigger domicile, assuming that you've shared your domicile, which is highly questionable. So theoretically, yes, if you go online and you look at the, uh, at the tax rule, theoretically you can avoid UK inheritance tax after five years of non-UK residency. 
But in practice, it's much more complicated because there's things and ties such as business interests, social and family connections, property ownership. And there's another thing called intentions, which I will address shortly, which could result in HMRC considering you domiciled for inheritance tax purposes. Even insignificant ties can be challenged by HMRC and, and they've been known to rely on the most tenuous of grounds to dismiss claims that the domicile of choice has been acquired. The most high profile case is that of the late um, Welsh actor Richard Burton. As some of you will know and recall, he lived in, in the US for many years uh, and then subsequently moved to Geneva in Switzerland in, in, uh, in 1957. He spent the next 20 years in Switzerland until he passed away in 1984. He received top advice, packer advice in the UK on how to sever his ties to avoid UK inheritance tax. Unfortunately, the UK tax authorities made an inheritance tax claim on his estates based on the grounds that he never actually relinquished his UK domicile. And um, which was a bit strange because he had um, he had um, severed his UK ties, as I said, 30 years earlier. Uh, but they successfully claimed that since he had purchased, and this is where it gets, gets a bit tricky here, purchased a burial plot in Wales. So his intentions were always to retain, to, to, to return. And he retained them, so he therefore retained emotional ties with his mother country and always intended to return to the UK. So, and apparently, uh, his request to be buried in a red suit, I presume that's something to do with a red dragon, and with a copy of Dylan Thomas' poems, uh, did not help his case. As a result of that, his worldwide estate, which was valued at the time, at 5 million suffered um, a tax claim of 2.4 million, which, is, um, which was a lot of money in those days. Yeah. Uh, and, and, he'd been, and, and there's other high profile cases involving PricewaterhouseCoopers, a family moving to Monaco with 300 million, and something very similar occurred, and they suffered a significant inheritance tax liability. So, I mean, HMRC never gives up on your domicile. And it's, you, you have to ensure that it's done properly and correctly. There's good news, though. And the good news is that being a UK non-tax resident really does provide you with plenty of tax planning opportunities to restructure your worldwide assets and your estate um, to either mitigate or to completely eradicate or potentially eradicate any liabilities to UK inheritance tax. And this is where a firm like ours can uh, embed value by not looking at, you know, their immediate client's needs are, but looking at it on a holistic basis and finding um, holes and weaknesses in the old tax planning to try and avoid a problem, a problem further down the line. And maybe the individual has long passed away, but the children will be left with a liability. Which is true, I guess. You, you might think you've lost your domicile, but you're not there to defend your position to HMRC. Exactly. Um, so that's and we know to you that your, your heirs have paid a large chunk of your estate to, to the taxman, and, and I'm, I'm sure no one wants to do that. Of course not. So, Paul, you've delivered the bad news there. The good news will be delivered by myself as a exactly. good guy later, but there are ways to, to plan against this, Absolutely. which um, is quite unique to expats, so is, is not available in, in the UK. So um, we'll move on to section two, which we'll cover the, the, the visas very briefly. Of course, this is, and, and I'm saying that as, as a viewer of, of, of Brits looking to, to move to Portugal or other places in, in, in the EU, this is a, a post-Brexit issue. Um, for those who do have access to an EU passport, then you continue to retain the right to live and, and work in, in other EU countries and, and therefore it's very simple for you. Um, for Brits, 
not so simple, I'm afraid, as it once was. In, in fact, I had a conversation before with a couple um, very recently, and, and, and they thought, right, let's jump in the car, pack all our stuff, drive to Portugal, start our new life, and, and it's not as simple as that anymore, I'm afraid. So we look at the main types of visas. Um, the first one is, is the golden visa. You've probably come across these before and, and we won't go into the kind of full detail of these because it is something that needs to be looking, looked at on an individual basis. But the golden visa is a way of gaining residency um, via investment. Um, one of the parts of the golden visa is one of the features is you, you don't need to spend a significant amount of, of time in, in Portugal, in fact, you only have to spend seven days in the first year and, and then in the following two year periods, 14 days. So again, equivalent of, of seven days. Um, we have to obviously have the caveat that if you have the golden visa and, and you're not spending 183 days in, in Portugal, then you likely won't become Portuguese tax resident and retain your UK or other country tax residency. Um, the, the main way of, of gaining the, um, the golden visa is through investment. Now, traditionally, we've seen individuals do this via real estate, um, an investment of, of half a million thousand um, euros, uh, 400,000 euros in a low density area. Now, this has become more complicated for, for um, those looking for a golden visa. Um, because of the new rules that many of you might have seen in the sense that the property has to be purchased in approved areas and this does not include Lisbon, Porto and, and the most of the Alcar. So a lot of the areas people are looking to move to. Um, there are other options um, and we are seeing more of a, a, a kind of um, drive and, and um, appeal for those options which include um, investment in a Portuguese investment fund, their version of a venture capital fund. Um, some of these are, are very interesting and, and they have the combination of um, allowing residency via the Golden Visa, but also they offer some kind of investment opportunities there. Um, tend to be invested in property, which the rules dictate that 60% of that property needs to be in Portugal. The second most common visa is, is the D7 visa, um, which is also known as the passive income visa. So um, this is for people who receive income via UK rental property or pension income, um, dividends or, or, or investments that you might hold. Um, it is possible to demonstrate that you have the sufficient funds via um, a, a large amount of, of savings and investments rather than just an income, but the income requirements are relatively low. You need to demonstrate that you have 7,620 euros for an individual or 11,430 euros for a couple. So that's really designed to be equivalent of, of the Portuguese minimum wage. So effectively they're saying, right, you are not a burden on the state, you've got enough funds to, to sustain your, your lifestyle. Interesting with the D7 visa, which you don't have in other countries that have a passive income visa, you can still work as long as you can demonstrate that you've got the funds um, to live passively. Um, for these visas, you, you do need a clean criminal record, comprehensive health insurance, the non-lucrative visa, you need to prove that you've got accommodation for you and your family, this needs to be for a minimum of 12 months, or obviously if you bought one. And for the golden visa, you need a sworn statement to, to prove that you will retain your investment for five years. So those of you thinking, might I invest my money, get my visa and, and then take it back? I'm afraid that's not the case. You, you need to retain that for, for the full five years. Um, the reason it's five years is, is that's the temporary residency you, you have for one year then another two years, another two year period. After that five years, then you can apply for permanent residency. Um, so those are the main visas. And there's also the D2 visa. This is aimed at uh, entrepreneurs, those looking to establish a business in Portugal. Um, it's a much lengthy process, harder to obtain. You need to submit business plans. You need to uh, be able to prove that you've got sufficient funds to 
um, set up the business and, and sustain it as, as it grows and, and you need to establish the business in, in Portugal. So you need to establish a business in Portugal, you can't do so with an already established company in, in the UK. Um, lastly, there, there is a, a visa that um, you can gain via an, an employer-sponsored visa, um, but a big condition of that is, is that um, they need to be able to prove that they can't source other candidates in the EU, not just Portugal, in the EU. So there's very few jobs that have to be vacant and a niche that would be able to allow them to, to have approval for, for that visa. So we talk about the visa and, and, and the, the right to residency, and, and so we will move on to taxation. Um, as I said at the outset, we will cover NHR very briefly, but we, we've covered this separately before. Um, for those who don't, who aren't aware of, of um, the NHR, what I'm referring to there, that's a non-habitual residency scheme. So it's not a way of, of gaining residency, it's a tax scheme for those who already have residency. The key requirements though are that you can't have been a, a Portuguese tax resident in, in any of the five previous years. And um, to use the NHR, you, you have to become a tax resident. So you have to spend a minimum of 183 days in, in Portugal. There are a few other conditions, which again, we've covered those in, in the past. So the NHR, what it offers is, is extremely generous tax benefits for, for those um, that come under the scheme. So these include um, employment income is taxed at a flat rate of 20%. Um, that's as long as it comes from a employment activity that's approved by NHR. Um, so there's certain categories of, of employment that come under that. Foreign sourced income is exempt from, from tax as long as it's deemed taxable in, in the country where it's generated. So UK rental income, real estate capital gains in the UK, exempt in Portugal. Dividends is, is a huge draw um, because of the double taxation agreement between the UK and Portugal. The UK are effectively saying, right, you're a non-resident, we don't tax the dividends. Portugal are saying, okay, the dividends are, are, are taxed in the country where they derive under NHR, so there's zero taxation. For those who have, have a company and want to draw dividends or can draw dividends, it's extremely generous. Um, and the final one is pension income, which is paid at a flat rate of 10%, but it is possible, Paul, to reduce that down even further, and we will cover that shortly. Um, the only main exception not covered by NHR is, is, is capital gains, which is 28% in or outside NHR. So I probably covered the NHR taxation in a bit more detail than I was planning to, but we will move on. And, and this is effectively your standard taxation in Portugal. So this is for those who don't qualify for the NHR, those already living there and, and haven't applied for NHR. Uh, the NHR period lasts for 10 years. This is what happens after those 10 years. So Portuguese income taxes is similar to what we used to in the UK in the sense that it works on a progressive tax rate system. What we mean by that is the more you earn, the higher the tax rate on, on that band of earnings. Works from 14.5% all the way up to 48%. In Portugal, there is a basic personal allowance as we have in the UK, but it's very low. It's, it's just over 4,000 euros, 4,104 euros in, in Portugal compared to the 12,570 pounds we, we have in the UK. Um, there are certain a, a additional topples for that depending on your circumstances, but it's a very low personal allowance. Um, pension income is, is added to your income tax, so each is in those tables, um, but again, that potentially could be reduced and we'll cover that shortly. Capital gains tax we talked about before is 28% NHR or no NHR. Um, Matt, one, one quick question that arises from the capital gains. What about, um, well, two, two questions in fact. Yeah. How can you circumvent capital gains tax if you move to Portugal and you're disposing of your, of, of, of your business? Okay. Yeah. And two, what other ways maybe using property and downsizing can you avoid some capital gains? Okay, that's, that's some good questions. The latter, 
Yeah. Um, I'll cover that first. Okay. Um, as um, so, uh, and it's an interesting point, I think, Paul, because in the UK we sell our main property and there's no tax to pay. Correct. In Portugal, you sell your main property. That's not the case. There's um, 50% is, is liable to capital gains. Now, there are caveats with that. So if you are moving to another property that's of equal or higher value, then that doesn't apply. So that's great as we move, move up the housing chain. But naturally, we get to a stage where, oh, do we want to sell our property and, and, and maybe rent? I see a lot of people doing that. Uh, we want to downsize our property and, and move to a lower value property. So in that situation, you write it, it actually creates a, a capital gain at, at um, 50% of that, at 28%. Now there is a, a way to, to mitigate that. So as you can use buying property to, to, to um, offset that, you could invest that money in a um, qualifying savings schemes of a qualified pension. Now, interestingly, we will be talking about something called a QNOPS later and the Portuguese compliant bond. So both of those apply for that exemption. So if you're downsizing your property and you have, I don't know, an excess of, of 200,000 pounds, there could be a large amount of capital gains on that. If you invest that sum in a qualifying pension or a qualifying savings, which the Portuguese compliant bond is, then that means you won't have to pay that capital gain. So it's a very interesting, and it's um, for me, it's, it's not quite straightforward. It's, it's, it's complicated, and, and so I think that's where we can have one-to-one -one discussions with, with people and, and um, see how they can take advantage of that. Because it's, it's been quite a shock for people before they downsize their property, and, and you don't expect that. When it comes to um, when it comes to selling a business. If you're a tax resident in Portugal, then capital gains are applied. But Paul, I'm going to flip this and, and, and pass this to you. Are there any other options that they could do to, to, to protect against that? Well, well Matt, I mean, you know, you're quite right. I think one of the weaknesses, the, the only weakness with this non habitual residency regime is that you pay capital gains at 28%, whether you qualify as a tax resident in Portugal under normal rules, or under the NHR rules. I think that's a major weakness. Now, um, what you're allowed to do, you can postpone and put on hold your non habitable residency for a year. You can move to a third country that has zero rate capital gains tax. Stay there for a year, year and a half. Dispose of your UK, product, UK business was in a jurisdiction with zero capital gains dispose of it, yeah. and then move back to Portugal and resume your non-habitual residency or your normal residency. And that avoids capital gains on disposal of UK assets. Now, it doesn't really matter if you move around. Of course, you have to be careful that you don't trigger residency in Portugal in the period you've been away. Gibraltar offers civil rated capital gains. So you have to be careful you don't somehow trigger residency in Portugal, but the important point as well is and the key point is you have to remain for more than five years not UK residents for, 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 to avoid capital gains tax on your return to the UK. The whole point is you don't pay tax initially, but to ensure that you're never liable for UK inherit, for UK capital gains tax on the disposable disposal of that asset, you need to remain outside the UK for an extended period greater than five years. And then you can flip around between jurisdictions outside the UK. Okay, so that time you spend out to the UK, it doesn't really matter if you're in Portugal or if you're in, say, for example, Gibraltar, when you're realizing the capital gains, Correct. that mixture doesn't matter. It's just key to spend that time outside Absolutely. the UK. Okay, that makes sense. Perfect, thank you. And, and the final point is, is wealth tax, which is something that we're unfamiliar in the UK. Now, wealth tax varies in, in different kind of European countries. Um, in Portugal, it's, it's solely based on, on your property. So not your overall wealth, it's, it's just the value of your property. Um, and it's for the value over 600,000 euros. Um, and the rate can, can vary. It's, it's between 0.7 and 1.5 at the moment, but this depends on, on the location of the property, the type of property, and a few other factors as, as, as well. 
So, um, interesting, we, we, we come to a, a cure ops, which we kind of led some work to, to here. And, and so, for those who don't know, a, a cure ops is an offshore pension. It's a qualifying or recognized overseas pension scheme. And, and for those who use the cure ops, these tend to be based in Malta. The reason for that is it's a, it has a double taxation agreement with, with Portugal. So, a, a cure ops is, is funded from a transfer from your UK pension. So, there are many reasons why you might want to consider this. Um, again, you, you might want to kind of uh, sever ties with the UK and, and removing the assets from that. Um, one of the, the financial ones there is, is the lifetime allowance. So in the UK, we, we have the lifetime allowance, which dictates the, the value of your pensions. And, and if you go over this amount, you pay tax on, on the, the amount that exceeds it, 25% on income, 55% on, on lump sums. Currently stands at, at just over 1 million. Um, but what you can do if you transfer your pension to a, an offshore scheme like a QROPS before you exceed that limit, then what happens is a, a benefit crystallization test where they assess the value of your pension or pensions, the, the, the value is the accumulation of all your pension assets. Um, and if you are under this, then there's no charge. And then your pensions can continue to grow offshore. And, and because they've already been tested, then there's no further tests are, are applied. Um, I'll come to the income in, in a, a minute, but there's another benefit in the sense that for those of us, which is, is a lot of people these days, if, if you pass away after age 75, in the UK, your beneficiaries inherit your pension, but you, they pay tax at their marginal tax rates. In Portugal, so uh, as uh, via a QROPS, um, that is not the case. If you die under age 75, it doesn't matter. There's no tax liability to your beneficiaries as long as they are direct family members. And, and that's just so there's no kind of Portuguese tax on that. So, so that's a, 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 an incredible benefit from that. And then we talk about the income from QROPS and, and uh, pension income under NHR. I'll call the first is 10 percent incredible but there is a way potentially that that can reduce down to just 1.5 percent so a QOPS can be paid by what they call a temporary annuity and this can be paid over three five or ten years and structuring this way can mean that the portuguese tax authorities only tax 15 percent of the pension income so 15 percent is taxed at a 10 percent tax rate that creates an effective rate of one and a half percent. Now it's a little bit contentious this issue, Paul, um, because it depends how the pension, the original pension, was funded. So the tax authorities in Portugal they differentiate between employee schemes and, and retirement savings. Um, so sometimes it's very clear if you've got an old style benefit, sorry, defined benefit pension purely funded by your employers, uh, the, the Portuguese authorities will say that's a workplace scheme and, and therefore you can't use this temporary annuity. If you have a SIP that you built up from your kind of own savings, then that's a retirement savings and it would qualify for this. The grey area is in between. We often have these pensions where part of it is in, in funded by the employer, part of it by the employee, but we might have consolidated pensions from all over the shop. And, and what we what we see there is it's, it's very, very difficult to identify where the funding has come from and, and how motivated the, the Portuguese um, tax authorities are to delve via pensions to, to find that out. And, and from my experience, I think maybe the same for you, Paul, is, is I've never seen them challenge that and go through a pension and, and, and um, identified it in, in that way. I think that, that perhaps they're a bit more meticulous than they are in Spain. But I, you know, it's hit and miss. And, you know, it's difficult to give advice because it, it depends how thorough and how disciplined they are in following the rules. And very often, because they have a complete and utter lack of understanding of the UK pension system, if there's consolidation within a SIP, they don't necessarily go back in time. But again, it depends 
who you're dealing with at the other end yeah. and, and how it's treated for tax. I can tell you that in Spain, we've never come across a single case where they've applied those rules. But you're right, Spain and Portugal have similar rules when it comes to taxation of pension income and annuities, as you quite rightly say, um, are not available to individuals who have transferred an employer-sponsored scheme into a into a QROPS. Uh, so it's one where the individual requires advice and some guidance, but, but it remains a gray area and a potential pitfall. Yeah, no, I think there needs to be an individual assessment, yeah. I guess, is, is what we're saying. There is a, a, a the other option is the use of an international SIP. So mm -hmm. No, I just wanted to add something, if I may. Of course. I'm not disturbing your flow, Matt, and uh -huh. I apologise for that. But, but since we are on the subject of, of pensions and, and cure-ups, let me say that the window is not completely closing, but, but it's being tightened. And there's two things which are governing that. One is the the um, the overseas uh, transfer charge. Yeah, the yeah, overseas of, so, yeah. of, of 25 percent, which came into force in 2017 uh, because you know under pressure from the UK pension industry, the UK government decided to slap a 25 percent tax charge on pension transfers outside the EU or to a country where the member, the scheme member, the individual um, is moving to, to a particular country, but the trustees are in another. I'll give you an example. You have a Brit moving to Thailand, but the trustees are in Malta. Okay. Yeah. Then that would fall under, under the OTC and, and, and they would suffer a 25% tax charge. Fortunately, at least when we were part of the EU, um, the EU was excluded from the OTC for very simple reason, because the UK was part of the European Union, which has the, the four freedoms, one of which is the free movement of capital. And of course, what you can do is tax the free movement of capital, because you would be going against the four key pillars of the European Union. So transfers of, of UK pensions to the EU were not subject to the OTC charge, However, now that we are no longer members of the European Union, there's always noises in the background that if things get, um, yeah, if things change, and, and now we are discussing today, you've probably seen the headline news that, that the EU is, 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 may impose retaliatory measures if, if the UK ought to, um, um, to um, to be in breach of you know is it the North Island Protocol? Yes. Yeah. Then they may well uh, take retaliatory action. Then of course the UK in response could well say you know what UK pension transfers into the European Union are now also taxed at twenty five percent, which they could do. Of course. So so the window does close. And then secondly, Matt and Matt, people don't realize this, but in November twenty twenty one again under pressure from the UK pension industry. Um, the UK government decided to introduce a traffic light system which pension ceiling schemes were obliged to follow. So it's a red light, it's an amber, or it's a green. And basically they look at the um, they look at the scheme being transferred, the ceiling scheme, and they look at the receiving scheme. Where are the trustees based? In which country are they based? And do they have a good reputation? Who is the financial advisor with them? Are they regulated? What, what advice has the individual um, received? And they want sight of the letter of advice. What is the investment proposal that they're making? And factoring in all those things, they were then determined, should we give it a red light? In which case they are legally empowered to block a pension transfer? Or is it a, 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 a number? in which case there's enhanced due diligence and questions, or is it a clear-cut case where they're completely comfortable with the advice and they allow the pension to be transferred seamlessly without any hitches. But it is no longer as straightforward as it used to be, and, th and these things can evolve and change over time. So I think people have to be mindful when they have UK pensions and they could benefit from a tax perspective 
from having a cure or, or some other arrangement that things don't stand still in time, things will change. Yeah. So our advice, not unless you think of something else, but two things are the OTC and the traffic light system of the seating schemes. No, it's which is a recent development. No, it's a very good point, Paul. And, and yeah, we, we, we're talking today uh, about okay, here are your options, including transfer to a cure ops. And, and will there still be an option in, in a few months or further down the line? We can't say. And, and you can see an argument for both sides. And, and I can almost see it from the UK's point of view in the sense that, okay, do they want the loss of all these pensions to the EU, who they are conflicted against? Uh, and, and yeah, they might make that difficult. So there is a great opportunity at the moment, but, but we've all... Um, and, and I guess once you've made the transfer, that's okay. The transfer is complete. They won't ever backdate it. There's no issue of that. It's just the issue of this kind of closing door. Um, when we talk about the pension transfers, then there is an alternative option, not quite the same, though, but um, there's the use of an international SIP, um, which is more similar. It's a UK regulated um, pension, so it's not a complete transfer from the UK, but what it does allow you to do is, is hold assets in, in euros or other um, currencies, which you may not be able to on your UK set, but also have it all in euros. So income, reporting, everything. So, you know, for individuals who are moving from the UK and, and now living in Portugal, your life becomes in euros, you're spending, you're measuring. So being able to have that ability to say, right, I, I, this could be in line with, with my lifestyle that is an interesting option as well and, and people talk about the difference okay should i use an international sip or should i use a cure ops and the answer to that is that there is no consistent answer it depends on people's individual circumstances maybe the value of their pensions are they planning to take income in the future what age are they about? a lot of lot of interesting questions and um, again that's something that we're happy to talk to people on, on an individual basis and, and the next I, we come to is, is the QNOP. So this is a qualifying non-UK pension scheme. And, and this is sometimes known as the sister product of, of the QROPs. And um, the key difference is that a, a QROPs is, is funded from a pension transfer, as we've discussed, whereas a QNOPs is, is funded for a lump sum investment. Um, so there's a lot of benefits for, for using a QNOPs in, in Portugal for one. There's no capital gains. We talked about capital gains at 28%. Um, and then we talk about the, the income that can be paid at a beneficial rate. This is ambiguity with a QROPS. There's no ambiguity with a QROPS. It's a retirement savings vehicle. So under MHI, you would pay tax at 1.5% um, on income payments. Outside of NHR, we're looking at... Um, the figures is somewhere between kind of two and five percent, two and five and a half percent. It depends on your kind of progressive income tax levels of that. So it works out that it's um, fifteen percent tax against the level of, of, of tax you're paying at that time. Um, now, a very interesting part of a QNOPS, and, and we talked about domicile earlier, Paul. Um, you, you kind of need to live that bad news and, and here is the good news this is one of the ways that, that you can protect against UK inheritance tax if you place assets or a, a, a sum of money within a QNOPS that is immediately outside of your estate for UK inheritance tax and that works even if you return to the UK so we're talking about 40% inheritance tax I believe it is that sum is immediately outside, outside of your estate so that's something the that beneficiaries might be um, yeah, pretty happy about. The, the kind of caveat with that is, is a QNOPS has to be set up as a genuine retirement vehicle, must be in line with somebody's wealth, agent, and future income. Uh, what we mean there is, is you have an individual with, with 2 million euros, they want to put in, in assets, they want to put the whole lot in the QNOPS, that's an IHT fudge. Same if you've got an individual, they're on their deathbed, they say, right, let me put my assets, you know, within a QNOPS. Again, it's an IHT fudge, for want of a better phrase. So that wouldn't work. But there's lots of scenarios where it does work and, and could be very valuable. 
in many ways, including you know, um, moving that outside your um, estate for UK inheritance tax. Can I just say something on the keynotes as yeah. well? Because what I find is that if we go just back one slide, of course, yeah. What I find is that people leave it very, very late yes. in the day to set up their QNOTS arrangement. And again, it just goes to show that rules um, change over time. And now most pension trustees won't allow you, like often happens in the UK, to set up the QNOTS arrangement in the, on their deathbed. And whereas before they would allow someone to set up a retirement savings scheme up to age 85. And of course, HMRC can question why would anyone make retirement pension provisions at age 85. Now they're prepared to accept it until age 75, after which the, the door closes. So like anything else, Matt, you know, doing things in a timely manner works Absolutely. and is strongly recommended rather than leaving it to the last hour and then missing the opportunity. Absolutely. And we, and we talk about one of the conditions is, is based on the individual's age. Correct. So naturally, as you get older, there is less funding that you can put into the queue. Absolutely. So the earlier, the better, and, and you can take advantage of, of, of that opportunity. Um, the longer you leave it, again, that door slowly closes before it's an option. Um, and um, the final uh, option we want to talk to people about is a Portuguese compliant bond. So again, uh, there's the issue with capital gains tax in Portugal, NHR and no, non-NHR is 28%. And, and in the UK, we are used to things like ISAs and, and other tax wrappers or tax-friendly vehicles. Um, but what we don't realise is as soon as you become non-UK residents, be it Portugal or anywhere else, the ISA no longer works as a wrapper. Um, so you have funds in an ISA or a, a similar product, they will tax that in Portugal at 28% on, on the gains. So uh, Portugal, and from a kind of financial services point of view, they've never really had an, an alternative for that. And, and the Portuguese compliant bond is, is a, a relatively new product um, to the market. It's a life insurance wrapper, or a life insurance contract that acts as a wrapper around the assets held there. No immediate capital gains, and you only pay tax if you make a withdrawal or a surrender. When you make that withdrawal surrender, you only pay tax on the gains. And, and a, a, an interesting feature is the longer you hold the Portuguese bond for, the, the tax rate actually reduces. So starts off with 28% because that is uh, the capital gains rate, reduces down to 11.2% after eight years. So it's generated for, for somebody who's not looking for an immediate income from that um, because the longer you hold it for, the, the more generous the tax rate. We produced a, a, a very basic diagram for you using an example, somebody's um, made a modest investment of 100,000 euros there. Um, we've got growth of, of 50% there. Um, so when it comes to surrender, we can see two thirds is capital and only one third is again. So only that one third is, is tax, um, which is 5,000 euros in that. Because we've held it for eight years, the tax is only 11.2% rather than the 28%. So we look at a tax bill of only 560 euros. That works out as an effective rate of, of just 3.73. And just to go back to what we were talking about before, when we were talking about downsizing property or, or even just selling your home and, and maybe renting afterwards, the Portuguese compliant bond and the QNOPs that we discussed earlier, those are both qualifying for, for that. So you can use those to add multiple benefits and, and that is well, that is one of them. I mean, the only advice I would give Matt, and I don't know whether you agree with me or not, is that you really shouldn't invest in a Portuguese compliant bond unless the intention is to not to tap into the funds for these eight years, because that's where you maximize your tax efficiency. And something that people don't really get is that should you return to the UK, which is quite common, yeah, of course, then that Portuguese compliant bond can be 
um, converted into a UK compliant bond, which allows you to draw 5% uh, tax free every year. Yeah. And you can have a discounted gift trust on top or a capital redemption bond to protect for inheritance tax. So there's ways of mitigating inheritance tax with the Portuguese bond. It will return back to you again, convert it into a UK bond. Yeah. So there's some distinct advantages there of the Portuguese bond. If there's any, of, you know, should you return to the UK at some point in the future? Yeah, and I, I think it's something that we should all always consider because yeah. I've come across so many people. I know you have all of them say, right, we moved to Spain or Portugal, this is our life now, but, but things change, you know, maybe grandchildren come along, you want to spend more time with them, circumstances change, whatever it is. So it's nice to have something as, as flexible as, as the Portuguese compliant bond and, and the QNOPs, which again, if you return to the UK, it's still compliant. And, and I agree with you that the Portuguese compliant bond is really designed for those people who aren't looking for immediate income Really, they they look into a kind of draw one in eight years plus. I think they you can have access to it in an emergency. Of course, it's your money, but you really need to be kind of planning with a, a long term mindset. And, and I think it's created for those who have any child in, in the early stages, but know they will be staying in Portugal beyond that ten year period. It's outside the scope of this presentation to talk about time apportionment, but that this Portuguese bond should you return to the UK will attract tax relief in terms of time apportionment. Yes. In terms of the period that you've been outside and then you turn back to UK. So that is also a major attraction of um, yeah, yeah and, and, and top slicing community and top slicing to that. Yeah. Correct. Good, good. Wonderful. So that is um, the main part of that presentation. Um, We'll move on to a few questions, and, and Paul, you have a few questions for me? I always do, but okay, be sorry, nice. I try to be kind, but, but I have a few. So my first question would be, can I move to Portugal and elect to pay my tax in the UK? Okay, good question. Some of you might think that's a bit of a silly question, but you'd be surprised how many people ask us that. The answer is no. If, if you, well, if you move to Portugal and become a tax resident, and, and by that we mean you spend more than 183 days there, or your main resident and home is deemed to be that, then you're a Portuguese tax resident, you need to pay tax and, and declare your tax there. It's, it's essential, there's no way around it, there's common reporting standards, exchange of information. The Portuguese authorities will know that you're generating that, that money in the UK, so you need to declare it, unless you want to face potential with heavy fines, interest and, and not just for this year they will look back as well and, and so yeah that's a complete no for me what about uk state pension how is it taxed and treated okay so um yeah that's a good question actually paul so the uk state pension um once we exit the uk and when we talked about exiting the uk and done properly then then this is paid gross so we pay the taxation in in, in portugal um but a good thing about that and, and um, useful is, is that the UK state, state pension, it um, benefits from the annual uplift and the triple lock. Um, the normally is the double lock we had this year, but we won't go into that. Um, but if you move to Portugal, you continue to benefit from that. So you continue to get that uplift um, every year and, and then you will pay your Portuguese taxation on that as, as, as pension income. Okay, and what about the will? Do you need a, a will in Portugal or will the UK will or the UK will suffice? Good question. And you are likely to need both. If you are a tax resident in, in Portugal and, and especially if you're planning your life in Portugal, you need a will in Portugal, but also if you retain assets in the UK and rental property, or even a home that you use, whatever that may be, you need a UK will for that as well. But um, you need a will for your Portuguese assets, but also there's another consideration. Um, Portugal, like, um, like many European countries, they have um, forced heirship. And, and, and what that means is that your assets will be distributed 
as decided by the state. So there's, there's um, they effectively tell you who's inheriting your, your, your money or your assets. So you need to make sure you have your will in place so you can overrule that. So it's very clear who you pay, passing your, your assets to. So, so a will is, is always very important, but in Portugal, it's even more important because of that. I have one final question. Can you work in Portugal um, with a D7 visa or a golden visa? You can, you can. So um, it's an interesting one. The, the golden visa is, is very clear that, yeah, you, you, you can work there and, and that, that's a non-issue. And, and the golden visa is, there's many moving parts, you know, are you using it to, to just be a full-time resident? Some people use it just as an entry into Europe and don't want to spend too many days there. It, it does vary on that, but yes, you, you can work. The D7 visa, again, it does allow you to work, but to, to gain the visa, you need to make sure that you can demonstrate you have passive income for that. So you, you can't demonstrate, you can't get that using your employment. Even if it's remote working, they, they won't view this as, as, as passive income. And, and, Something that's interesting to, to bear in mind is, is that you gain your visa and, and but the, the, the residency is valid for one year. Yeah. You need to renew that for another two years. So you still need to retain that passive income by your pensions or your investments or your dividends or however that is. Okay. Thank Good, thank you, Paul. So um, yeah, I struggled through those, but I got less. So not revenge, but as, as returning the payment, if I can ask you one question. And I think this is the most important question of the day. So what is one piece of advice would you give to anyone looking to move to, to Portugal? Well, I think you need to look at it from two angles, whether you are moving to or already living in Portugal. And I think it's, you know, if you're already, if you're moving to, clearly you have a distinct advantage because you have time on your hands to plan accordingly and the certain advantages to that that you can avail yourself of um, and always but if you're living in Portugal there's still tax planning opportunities that you can take advantage of I don't think it's within the um, remit of this webinar to cover the nuances and the differences but suffice to say that it's always our advice to plan ahead and, and as you know Matt from dealing with a lot of relocations it's always unfortunately uh, quite a bumpy road uh, and you need a trusted advisor by your side that can make the journey easier for you and ensure a smooth and seamless transition to Portugal um, because of the ambiguity and the uncertainty and the way tax rules are applied it's so important that you have someone who's batting for you on your side continuously and giving you um, advice that stands the test of time and reliable advice and, and guiding you through the whole process. And in that regard, failing to plan is really planning to fail. Uh, you need a timeline, you need a strategy, and of course you need an advisor that can help you to execute that strategy. Um, and you can miss key steps along the way if you're not properly advised, and what you find is that those Missing those key steps can be really um, very, very costly. Look, you don't go online and you Google, you know, your symptoms, and then, and then based on those symptoms, you, you look at the prescription and you out prescribe yourself, right? You need to have someone that can 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 guide you and give you that assessment, and um, and that's why you know you need you need a professional to guide you. Um, and I always say that you plan, you plan first and you move later. And planning begins before you exit, not after. Um, and you know, this, this is, you know, with the, in this regard, it's okay to be a tortoise. You don't have to be the hare. Um, this is not a race. Uh, this is all about executing correctly. Um, so take your time, plan it thoroughly and correctly, take the right steps at the right time for the right reasons, and it won't go very wrong if you're in good hands and you've got a reputable firm like ours to guide you along the way. 
And then finally, if I can go back to my favorite theme, which would be tied up here, which is UK inheritance tax and UK domicile. Um, I think when it comes to UK inheritance tax planning, it's always advisable to plan for the worst and assume that you're going to be liable and then hope for the best because what you don't want is a negative posthumous determination by HMRC to reduce the inheritance which quite rightly belongs to your heirs, to your children. And I think I've already given the example of Richard Burton and I could cite many more. Um, so you, that's one area where advice is needed and good tax planning can save a lot of money. Okay, thank you, Bob. I think I'd have one, one thing as well. I think what is important to understand both sides, you need to have work with someone who understands the UK and the Portugal side, cool. because otherwise you're missing, a, a, I mean, I've come across it and, and someone in the UK will say this, but then that doesn't work in Portugal, vice versa, and, and it all becomes incredibly complicated. And I think really what's important is, is to have that one advisor firm by your side who can go the whole way with you. Absolutely. I think what you find is that some UK advisors want to retain the relationship and they think they can impose that UK tax law can be transposed into a third country and unfortunately it doesn't work like that. And where we are versatile in that, that we are both UK advisors regulated by the financial and authorised by the Financial Conduct Authority, understanding the UK tax rules as well as how it operates in Portugal. So we can advise from both angles, which I think is really important to plan the exit correctly, as well as the arrival in the new country of residence. Absolutely, absolutely. And that takes us nicely to um, the roadmap. So we, we've created this and, and we, we talk about planning a, a lot in this and, and you may doubt what we're saying, but it's incredibly important. And, and Paul rightly says, don't be the hair, don't rush into things, take your time. Um, because you miss one of those steps and, and you know you, you miss the opportunity or, or mistakes can happen. So we say plan with the destination in, in mind. So I, I think you all probably know where you want to be, you want to and then visit what your life is going to be, and, and it's just making that happen in, in, in the right way. So what we'd recommend is, is you, you gather all your information together and, and then you review this. You discuss your problems, fear, pain points and, and concerns, and it's the sort of conversation that we have with people um, almost daily. You understand what you need and what you require. You identify your current and, and future sources of income and, and the taxation that will follow with this. Establish the amount of time you intend to spend in the various countries, Portugal, the UK, and, and maybe even a third country. Evaluate the viability of what you're looking to do. Consider the UK exit strategy and, and review the UK statutory residency test, which will of course determine the amount of time that you should be spending in the UK. Back to our favourite subject, discuss UK domicile, assess any potential liability to UK inheritance tax and, and look at those UK IHT mitigation techniques. You can never plan early enough for that. Consider and review the, the residency and visa options for those relocating. Understand the pla ta tax planning opportunities that are available. Then you can clarify the whole process. Again, for those relocating, source a qualifying property, either by rental or to purchase. Secure your mortgage finances if, if required. Address your healthcare requirements. So this includes your private medical insurance that you may need. Then you're in a position to apply for the, the appropriate visa. Then following that, you apply for NHR. It's important that you have the residency and, and then you apply for NHR, which has very strict timescales, which we, we covered previously. Then you're in a real strong position. You can truly consider the impact of your change of residency on your assets and liabilities and, and optimize your tax position and, and then Finally, conduct a full review of everything, your pension, savings, investments, as well as your, your protection policies, which is often overlooked and, and 
you need to make sure you have that continuity of cover because often these policies will, will only cover you in the UK or, or where you've come from and, and people don't consider that, forget about it, they move to Portugal and, and you only realise you're not coming until you make a claim. So very important to, to review everything and, and have that advisor by your side who can guide you through the process. So um, great, that's the end of, of the presentation. I, I can see we, we've got quite a few questions that have come through um, throughout the webinar. So we'll just bring the, these up and, um, and, and read through these for you. So. So the first one is, is somebody asking about the, the recording of the, of the session and we will contact people after, after the webinar. I think it's a good case site. I mean, this is in answer to FISA, Pfizer, and, and the question is whether you pay any capital gains tax on any UK property. Um, in the UK and, and we do is capital gains tax only from April 25th, only on the gain from April 2015 onwards, rather than prior gains, which are completely excluded because the, the rules in the UK where if you're a non-tax resident and you have a capital gain on the UK property, there was no tax yeah. up to April 15. So when they right. enacted the new law, they said you will be subject to UK capital gains on the UK property as a non-resident, but only from April 15 onwards. So what is the position in, in, in Portugal? And I think being a UK side of asset, I would imagine there's no taxation whatsoever. So there's, there's taxation on the UK and, and um, there should be taxation during the NHR. Um, post NHR, you have to declare that in, in Portugal, but there's a double taxation agreement. So um the taxation that you pay in the uk is is it's relieved uh, exactly yeah you receive a tax credit so likely your issue there is is with the um with the uk taxation so we have a question from richard here i'll ask you this one all if you don't mind yeah. so he's asking okay we've been told your vulture is on the portuguese blacklist in the sense that investments are excluded um from nhr if they were made in, in Gibraltar. If one were to invest with fiduciary wealth, would the investments be tax efficient in, in Portugal or would that be treated differently? So it's I, a good question. I think it's an absolutely incredible question. Richard, thank, thank you very much for, for, for asking that question. Um, you're quite right. Gibraltar is blacklisted by Portugal for no other reason than Portugal just follows the Spanish line. Now, as you probably know, perhaps not, but Gibraltar signed a ta international tax agreement, a treaty, double taxation treaty with Spain in March 2019, which came into effect in March 2021. That tax agreement states that after two years from the signing of the agreement, Gibraltar, Spain has to compulsorily um, whitelist Gibraltar as a jurisdiction. They haven't done so. And now the reason they're giving is that because the UK and Gibraltar are negotiating a Schengen Treaty with Spain and the EU, they're waiting back on that. But they're already reneging on an international agreement that they've signed, which is no big surprise. They, they said that we would be whitelisted. I am confident that when Spain keeps to that international agreement, double taxation treaty and whitelist Gibraltar, Portugal will follow suit because there's no valid explanation because Gibraltar is on the white list of the OECD. Now, in answer to your question about the position of fiduciary wealth, well, you know, if it's a pension arrangement, the trustees would be based in Malta because Malta has a double taxation treaty with Portugal. So the legal owners of the assets, you would be a scheme member and beneficiary, but, but the legal owners of the assets on paper would be the trustees and the trustees would be based in Malta, in which case, you know, the issue that you bring up wouldn't be a concern, nor would it be a Spanish compliant, a Portuguese compliant bond, yeah. uh, pretty much for the same reason, yeah? Yeah, it's based in, in Ireland. Uh, Correct. Um, and, and, and in any event, we are 
part of the AUKUS network, which is regulated out of the EU for European business. So, Richard, thank you so much for that question. Absolutely incredible question. You know, two questions in one. This is really interesting. But I guess the key is the assets aren't held in Gibraltar Correct. anyway. So Correct. there's absolutely no concern. Working with us wouldn't affect the taxation. Um, we have well, the first question from Will there. What if you continue earning income from UK company being paid in the UK? Does this impact residency or just a tax consideration? So um, your residency depends on your individual circumstances. We talked about the, the visas and, and the requirements for that, if you need a visa. Um, but yes, you can continue to, to earn income from the UK. Depends in what form that is paid. If, if you can be paid in dividends under the NHR, really, there's, there's likely no taxation. If you are earning a, a salary from a, a UK firm and maybe you're working remotely, then you have to declare that, you have to pay tax on it, but that shouldn't impact your residency as long as you can um, pass the other requirements required to, to gain your visa. Okay, what if you have a European account with significant investments in shares? Can these be moved to a CUNA without any UK tax paid for this transfer? Yeah, uh, you know, I think a CUNA is, is a bona fide uh, pension arrangement which has to be managed properly and correctly because, you know, this is not a SIP where the individual runs his own investments and just dumps assets into it. You know, you keep hearing, can I dump my property into a CUNA? Yeah. Well, in theory, you can. In practice, it doesn't really work, right? Because yeah. it's purchase and sale, and it, it entails the purchase and sale of the assets, and the other thing is one of the liquidity. So they're not really designed to put their own shares and to self-manage. So it's really an answer to, to that question, yeah, in theory you could, but I doubt it that any advisor would be happy to manage, to execute instructions from a underlying beneficiary because we are subject to heavy regulation, and, and liability as well. Yeah, and, and there's a potential capital gains situation there. Correct. The assets need to be sold, so you might Correct. have that in the UK uh, or when you're in, in Portugal. So it's... it's, it's that's fine. So um, Karim is asking, on a UK closed company paying dividends to the Portuguese NHRs, what are the tax implications in UK and, and Portugal? Um, so I... I I understand that question is we have an individual living in Portugal under NHR and they're receiving dividends from a, a, a UK company. But I think we, I think in answer to Karim, I think that's something that should be taken separately outside this forum. Yes. Because I think we need to clarify what it means by a closed company and what the implications are. And to answer that without the full and complete understanding may result in giving. Um, an opinion which is not really uh, relevant to his question. So Karim, if you don't mind, you can reach out to us by email. I would be happy to engage and clarify those two questions. No, no, no absolutely. Yeah, I, I think it would be unfair of us to, to give um, that precise information without knowing the full picture because yeah. We, we don't want to, to, to be doing that. So, so David has a question there. If you cash in 25% of your SIP, UK tax free, before you domicile to Portugal, which I presume you'd be changing your residency. Uh, again, there's a, the domicile and residency are, are two different concepts there. Um, and transfer the cash, will that be tax free in, in Portugal? For me, that's an, an, an interesting question. Or, yeah, I think it's very simple. I don't think as matter as you say, it's, it's nothing to do with domicile. But if you if you cash in a tax free lump sum in the UK from your SIP before you relocate and establish a tax residence in Portugal the year before the tax year before, then clearly there's no tax liability in Portugal, and that's exactly David the, the, the kind of advice that we would give you because this is an this is one thing that you miss out. Once you move, and then you want a tax-free lump sum, hey, there's no concept of tax-free in the portal, you pay tax. Yeah. So, so he, David can easily do that. Yeah, David, I think you really kind of uh, inadvertently really kind of 
um, proven our point with regards to the planning there, because I come across people like this so often. I've moved to Portugal, we've been here six months, we're having a great time, now let, now can I take my tax refund? So it's too late. Portugal doesn't recognise it, so you, you need to look at doing that in the UK, and then the income in Portugal, you get the best of both worlds. And then David asked the second question. Yeah. If, if the next drawdown is, is done whilst tax resident in Portugal, would this incur UK and or Portuguese tax? Well, once you're a tax resident in Portugal, you're only liable to UK uh, to a Portuguese tax unless you keep your pension in the UK. No? Correct, yeah. yeah. And even if, yeah, if, if yeah, tax was in Portugal, you, you pay your tax in, in Portugal. Portugal. Yeah. Um, Virak has asked, how much is the, the unit linked in insurance fee? So that really depends on circumstances. We're, we're talking about the investment and, and things like that. So Virak, feel free to reach out and, and we can we can discuss that with you in, in detail. Um, and then Dean, my wife is European. Can my daughter and I move to Portugal without the visa process? I, I believe you can, Dean. So, um, family reunification is a tricky one to say. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, always talk about that one, Paul. But um, yeah. no, it's true. Yeah, your your wife has uh, the right to, to reside in Europe and, and by the family reunification. So yeah. it's a difficult one. Um, yeah, you 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 can move with her, and, and yeah, you have to go through a, a, a different sort of kind of residency and visa process. But yes, you don't need the golden visa or the D seven visa. Um, so that's the questions. We've got some questions I think that have come through the the chat and got to the uh, Mary. Yes, you will get a, a copy of the recording, maybe. So that's not a problem. Kathy? So, sorry, what? Sorry, Kathy, but I can't do anything about my accent. So um, I'm sorry you can't understand what I'm trying to say. But you'll get a copy of the uh, presentation. Um, so another question from Kathy there. Can you transfer your pensions if you're already drawing the income? And, and that one's a, a no. If, you're already, if you've already taken the lump sum, you can transfer to a QOX, but if you've already taken the income, you cannot. So I absolutely, that's true. that is yeah. absolutely correct. Okay, and we've got a question from Raul there. Um, it's quite a detailed question there, Ra, which it seems to be specific to your circumstances. Paul, I, I think that's maybe one we should answer on a on an individual basis. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that one requires uh, a tailored response. Yeah, Ra, it's definitely something we can help you with there. But again, you know, it would be unfair of us to, to kind of give up a detailed answer based on kind of six or seven lines there. So yeah, feel free to reach out and, and I'm sure we can help you with that. Um, okay, and then a few people saying thank you there, which is, is very nice of you. So um, yeah, I think that, that reaches the end of that. So many thanks for, for joining us today. We, we hope that was informative. Um, I think there were a few kind of themes through that, planning, you do have opportunities and, and um, really, you know, part of the planning process is everything needs to be looked on, on an individual basis. So you're more than welcome to reach out. Our, our contact information is, is there. And, and yeah, we, we hope to speak to some of you soon. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye. Bye.